very much. Straighter. Sorry, I wasn't sure. All right, we have the mood. Um, we'll move straight into our next panel session. Uh, first, thank you to Anna and our fantastic panelists for the session on agriculture. Um, subject near and dear to my heart and to many of you here. We're shifting gears now and going into the panel called Health Check, what is the prescription for a healthier New Zealand? We have uh, fantastic panelists here, Des Gorman, Joe Lane and Cecilia Robinson coming at this angle from very different views. Uh, this will be uh, uh, hopefully an informative conversation. Again, lots of questions are coming through on the Slido. Um, keep those coming, I'll receive them through the iPad and we'll get into it. So I'll come over here and we will start with you, Des. What's your take? This is obviously a, a challenging area, one amongst many. Uh, what's your take on the situation? Oh, kia ora, Tano. Sorry, Des, it sounds like we might have a sound issue. Can I just get a microphone or something? Looks like we might have had a microphone malfunction. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start again. Kia ora te um, I hope you don't mind, Matt, but I was going to uh, spend my introductory comments on some observations about the state of the health uh, state in New Zealand and in the hope that when we get to the, con the open part of this, this, this session, we can focus largely on solutions and what needs to be done rather than relitigating these problems. So forgive me if I have a, a focus on what the current situation is and what I think the problems are. The first observation I'd make for you is that um, New Zealand actually doesn't have a health system we have a disease and injury management system. And it's funded annually on the basis of activity. So any disease and injury management system which is funded against volumes of activity on an annual basis inevitably directs political attention and funding to hospitals and end of life care. And for decades we've talked about the need to shift the point of care out of hospitals into the community and into people's homes. And we've also talked about the need to shift the locus of responsibility for health from providers like me to the citizenship. But a activity-based annualised disease and injury management system almost precludes those sorts of transformations. And in fact, it almost inevitably establishes what we have, which is a hospital-centric system. The second observation I would make as a preface is that it's becoming increasingly difficult for our public health care providers to live within their means and they are struggling to live within their budgets and you've seen in recent years governments having to produce the metaphorical second checkbook to write the debt off and in part that's because of the annualised approach but it's largely due to the shift in demographics where we now have a relatively large community of older people who consume a lot of health care but don't pay a lot of tax. And this is the reason, of course, why enlightened countries like Switzerland, uh, France, the Netherlands have shifted to social insurance schemes for their health. Germany, of course, has had a social insurance scheme underpinning its health system since, since 1883, the Bismarck system, which was introduced on the basis of the moral principle of solidarity. Korea's had an insurance-based health system since the Korean War, uh, and Singapore has a very complex social insurance scheme which includes health. Now, I'm not arguing that these insurance schemes 
are perfect or they don't have difficulties. They do, but the huge advantage they have over our system is that they move from act from funding of activity to move to funding uh, on a fully forward funded basis. So they tend to actually accumulate funds with time as compared to a pay-as-you-go system as we have. The other huge advantage of the social insurance schemes is that you're far more likely to invest in long-term returns. You're a lot more likely to invest in, lo in conditions <coughs> where the benefits to the individual and society are realised over subsequent years as compared to within the year you're in. Uh, the third observation I'd make, Matt, would be that uh, our health system is inherently inequitous. And there are all sorts of factors which contribute to that inequity, and I'll just mention two of them. Uh, one of them is that since 1938, our hospitals have worked on the concept of universalism. And when you have a universal healthcare system, there are two elements. The first is who is entitled, and the second is what are they entitled to receive. Now, we've always solved the first one, that's easy. All the citizens and uh, permanent residents of New Zealand are entitled but we've never defined what they're entitled to receive. So what we have is a situation of uncapped demand and a finite resource, which makes rationing inevitable. But that rationing has never been conducted in a transparent way. And instead, the rationing has largely been controlled by politically powerful aggregates, usually led by providers, but often with strong community support. And these political economies have been very successful in protecting the their own interests. For example, when health spend relative to GDP is going down, they have managed to ring fence their funding. When health spend relative to GDP is going up, they've captured most of the new money and it's been then marketed to the community as greater access, greater volumes, which of course the community experiences as reduced waiting times. But what this means, this system means that the well-funded areas can continue to be well-funded and the areas which are not well-funded continue to be poorly funded. For example, mental health. And mental health also clearly suffers because <coughs> it is least suited to an annualised activity type of budget. So how New Zealanders experience their health care depends upon who they are, where they are and what they need or, or want. And the final observation I'd make is that if we're looking at the existential risks to healthcare in New Zealand, I'd list them this way. I'd say it's workforce, workforce, and workforce. Uh, we have a workforce crisis, and yes, we need to recruit from offshore, and I'm very pleased to see that recent visa changes have taken the aged and residential care sector from an undersupplied labour market to an oversupplied labour market. And yes, we need to train more, but training more and recruiting both have significant lags. And so our attention has to be on retaining the workforce we have. And not only retaining them, but extending their roles and functions and the commitment that they make. So, look, so there's a series of observations, Matt, about our current situation. And I think the most important of those for you is that it's important for New Zealanders to realise we do not have a health system, and our health uh, injury and disease and management system does not behave like a service industry. Thanks, Matt. Kia ora, Des. Thank you. Uh, quite a lot in that, and I su suspect a lot of those themes will weave through the next discussion. I'm going to pass to you, Joe, next. Um, the last point on health force, I imagine, is one you may pick up, but I'll hand to you. Brilliant. Uh, kia ora, Tato. Um, so if New Zealand wants to be healthier, uh, we simply have to have a health workforce that is healthier too. Uh, health is one of the largest employers in the country. One in nine employees is employed in the health sector. And so to reiterate Des's point, we're really not going to fix some of the issues that we have in our health sector until we address uh, workforce. Um, there are chronic workforce shortages in effectively all of our health professions and different specialties. And if someone tries to tell you that this is due to the pandemic, um, they're either kidding themselves or they're lying to you. Because we've known about these problems for decades. You know, look back to the reports from the early 2000s that talk about our aging and growing population and the need to invest into further health workforce uh, development. 
So what is the prescription to a healthier New Zealand? I would say it is significantly increasing the number of students that we are training locally in our respective health uh, professions. That's the only sustainable long-term solution that is going to deliver the cultural uh, safety and the clinical safety that we expect here in Aotearoa. Uh, to pick up from Minister Willis's comments earlier, to try and address that, we really need to take a systems-based approach to look at where the problems are, because those challenges are different in the different professions. Um, for example, if you were to look at medicine, um, our fundamental problem is that we are training too few doctors. There just literally are not enough places. We've artificially constrained the supply going through our system, and if we benchmark ourselves across to the OECD, we find we're right towards the bottom of the pack. If we compare ourselves to Australia on a per capita basis, we've got 40% fewer medical training places. So there's simply not enough doctors going through the system, and our model of education that we are using is also not delivering the health work out workforce outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, put simply, too few are choosing primary care specialties or choosing to work in our regional communities. Compare this to something like pharmacy, though, uh, and we actually have too few students choosing to start pharmacy. Uh, we've had declining enrolments into those programs. The existing Bachelor of Pharmacy programs just aren't meeting the needs of learners coming into that space. And if you were to compare again to something like midwifery, the fundamental problem is about degree completion rates where they uh, hover just over 50%. Now, we need to acknowledge, if we're going to try to address some of those things, uh, that we can't just do more of the same. More of the same is not the solution uh, to these problems, and we need to start thinking about more modern solutions, more modern curricula and programs uh, to uh, suit learners. Over the past 20 or so years, learners have changed, and by and large, our curricula have not nor have our universities. We still expect students to turn up under the same sort of structure and model. And of course, people are having multiple careers in their lifetime. They're wanting to be able to change and tr transition to different careers. And yet we're still uh, structured around a go to university, be there full time for four years or something to train. Um, we also need to think about the barriers that are preventing students from enrolling into different programs and to completing them. Um, and I would suggest that with New Zealand's interest-free student loan scheme, which is effectively a deferred tax, user pays def deferred tax, um, we don't have upfront financial barriers stopping people getting into uh, health retraining or training, um, but the problem is cost of living while they go through those training processes. And so if we want targeted uh, investment to really deliver a health workforce uh, to fit the population needs, we need to start thinking about how we're supporting learners financially through their studies. Uh, to be clear, I'm not talking about going back to an earn-as-you-learn type model that gets bandied around a little bit, uh, but to think about some sort of paid-to-learn model, some sort of universal student allowance that's at a higher rate for priority areas uh, to really encourage people into those professions and to allow them to successfully complete their training and take up their position in our workforce. So I'll leave it there, Matt. Go to Joe, thank you. A lot there too. All right, across to you, Cecilia. You're obviously approaching this from quite a different perspective again via tent, so over to you. Um, kia ora, um, ko Cecilia Robinson, toku ingoa. Um, my name's Cecilia Robinson and I'm the founder and co-CEO at Tend Healthcare. Uh, we're one of the largest primary healthcare providers in New Zealand nowadays. We represent about 130,000 uh, Kiwis across our group. Um, and we were founded about three years ago. Uh, and what's really interesting to me about primary healthcare coming into this sector is all of the issues that have just so clearly been outlined and that we lack a really fundamental part of our system functioning really well, um, and that's technology. You know, our health system has been built of maybe 120 disparate systems that don't work to either favor the bureaucrats, the consumer, um, or the clinicians themselves, right? And so TEND has been founded around the idea that if we could start afresh with a fresh primary healthcare system, we would start with a phenomenal technology platform and then would integrate that into our operational clinics and into our day-to-day -day delivery. So I want to be clear, we're not a software as a service company. We are a primary healthcare provider that is powered by an amazing technology. 
Um, and this is how developing countries are actually able to leapfrog us as New Zealand and how they're delivering primary health care because they're starting with amazing technology and from that foundation, they're delivering services. And that's what we're doing at TEND. And, you know, we started with a thesis when we were initially exploring the concept for TEND about five years ago. And that thesis was around, could we make our workforce more productive? Could we change the way that they work? Could we have the right people doing the right things in the right way at the right time? Um, and that thesis is coming true. And so I'm coming at the health, um, from the health side, feeling positive today. At TEND, we're able to demonstrate that we can change the way that we're delivering services and who is delivering that service to that consumer at that point in time. And so I'm really excited about the conversation today and listening to some of the challenges and also sharing with you some of the achievements that we've had along the way. Equity is a massive big part of TEND and some of our, the things that we're most proud of has been seeing a significant enrolment um, in Māori across Auckland, about 20% higher than the average. And similar with our um, Māori, uh, with our tamariki Māori um, immunisations, again, about 20% higher than the average for Auckland. And our most recent clinic that we've reopened for services uh, post doing integration, we've seen a 70% uptake in Pacifica enrolment, a 30% uptick in Māori enrolments, and Asian enrolments as well. And so what we're demonstrating is that you can make a health system that is more equitable, that improves productivity, and that's able to deliver more for everyone that's involved in our system. So while we've got a lot of challenges, and we're facing those challenges every single day, there's also hope that for having appropriate technology operationalized for clinics, you can deliver a better healthcare system. Thank you, Cecilia. I'm actually gonna stay with you, although others might comment on this. There's a question come through here. Uh, what are the opportunities for earlier, earlier intervention in, in a health journey that can potentially, uh, you know, save costs over the long term. How do we get those, how do we get to people before things spiral out of control? Can you touch on that? And yeah, look, I'm you? really excited to share. I mean, we've not put a number of initiatives in place um, across our workforce and across our practices to be able to deliver a better customer experience. One of them is our online now service, which is the ability to be able to see a doctor uh, reasonably quickly. And by reasonably quickly, I mean often within a couple of hours, you're able to see one of our GPs online or you can book an appointment in our clinic. And what we're seeing is that we're preventing admission to emergency rooms for actually being able to see patients before they need to present to emergency rooms. And so this is really important. I think one of the things that does not get talked enough about in this country is that we've got about a half a million or 470,000 people who are not enrolled within a primary health care practice. And the problem for all of us is that these people are also presenting to emergency rooms when they have primary health care related issues. And so about 70% of people who present to EDs should have been prevented for primary health care. It's a dysfunctional system, right? Uh, and the incentives are not right. But what we're seeing and what we're being able to demonstrate is that if we can intervene earlier, we can prevent that presentation. And so we're doing that live, that's happening daily, and we're measuring that. And it's something that we're going to begin talking more about as we go through um, this year as well. So you can have a big impact. And that is about how you productize, how you improve productivity across your workforce and identifying the right person dealing with the right complaint at the right time in the right way. And that is something we've been hamstrung by for a long time is that the GP is kind of, you know, um, the center of everything. And we have to change that. Interesting. I'm actually going to leap from there but stay on the topic of general practice. So, Des, you've written a paper recently with Murray Horn about general practitioners, GPs. I picked up a stat there which, which caught me, and I've, uh, hopefully I've got this right. If we were to maintain the ratio of GPs <laughs> to population, I think 50% of our medical graduate school graduates would need to be coming out and choosing to go into general practice, but I believe only 10% actually intends to. Can you, when we hear what you're just talking about, Cecilia, about getting to people at the top of the cliff, it sounds like that problem, notwithstanding, you know, technological, uh, you know, changes that can help. How do we address that? Yeah, <clears throat> it's a very good question. The first observation I'd make is something Cecilia was talking about, which was 
the large number of people who are not enrolled uh, with a general practice. And I think we've got to understand that for most New Zealanders, uh, they regard health care like insurance. They just assume it'll be there <laughs> when they need it. And they don't necessarily see it as being their obligation to maintain their health and well-being. So to shift that locus of responsibility is going to require a culture change. And I think one of the meaningful steps towards that culture change is something that's happening now where disabled people are managing their own budgets and purchasing their health care. And that system's working very well. And in my opinion, uh, individual budget holdings should be extended to all disabled people with, opt with an opt-out option and to all people with chronic disease, actually, again, with an opt-out option as a first meaningful step in shifting the locus of responsibility from me as a provider to the citizenship. So I think uh, the problem with getting upstream is that the average New Zealander does not see health as their primary responsibility. They've abrogated that responsibility to the clever people who will look after them when the time comes. In terms of uh, our general practice workforce, uh, I, I see the future is we need to keep this waka afloat and then we need to find a way of getting the waka to Aotearoa. And in terms of keeping it afloat, the existential risk is uh, in our workforce. Uh, the recent Commonwealth Review suggested that 40% of our GPs intend to retire in the next year or so. Uh, when we did a big survey of our nursing workforce, a quarter to a half of them said they were either going to reduce their hours or stop working altogether as soon as they could afford it. So our real issue is how do we retain the workforce in place and increase the things that they do? In terms of our uh, output from our medical schools, and I'm ashamed to put my hand up and say that I was the head of the School of Medicine at the University of Auckland, and we continued to churn out graduates who had a strong affection for hospital-based specialities, which is hardly surprising. We trained them in teaching hospitals, so that's where their role models sat. The data you quote, Matt's accurate, and in fact, we're going to have to, for the next decade, to stand still in terms of GPs to community ratios. We're going to have to recruit 200 overseas doctors every year who will go into general practice just to stand still. Mm. And unfortunately, I, I think that's a pipe dream. Mm. And so reimagining general practice, and in particular, changing the business models in general practice, isn't a matter of fiddling with the systems in place, but it requires a complete recast. And it is possible to do it. And if you don't mind, Matt, I'll tell a very quick story. Uh, when Murray Hall and I were doing the review of the health system in Queensland, we became aware of a area in Brisbane where they had hospital ED overruns. Mm. And in fact, the, the hospitals couldn't cope. They had, they had ambulances ramped uh, down, down the ramp and around the corner. And so they went to the local general practice communities and said, what would we need to do to encourage you to do more after hours care, critical care, emergency care in the community? And that conversation went on for a while because the immediate response was give us more money and they said, well, if that was the problem, if that was the solution, we'd have fixed this a long time ago. And what they ended up eventually deciding on is a system where if the GPs agreed to audit and if the GPs agreed to do more after hours care and critical care in the community, they could call themselves a platinum practice. And if they became a platinum practice, they could order MRI scans and CT PET scans and investigations which currently are denied mm. to general practitioners. Mm. And instead of sending their patient to the hospital to be in an outpatient clinic, they could place them directly on an operating list. And so that system worked wonderfully well. There was a huge uplift in activity in that general practice community. The uh, over-tasking of the ED ceased. And when I went and asked the GPs, well, what was it that got you to this happy place? It wasn't money. It was the fact that they were taken seriously. It was the fact that their status had been enhanced, and that status had been enhanced by way of privilege. So there are ways in which we can keep this walker afloat, but it requires, as I say, a complete reimagining of primary care, where we take the word primary 
And we don't see GPs as triage for specialists like me, but we see GPs in the primary sense as being the key and the core of our health system. And people like me are partialists, and our job is to assist the GPs to manage the health care of their, their patients. But that story shows you how you can take a current underserviced area and change it by addressing predominantly status and privilege. Thank you, Ted. All right, a lot of questions coming through here. I'm going to go to one for you, Joe. So there's a, workforce is critical. Um, the team here from Scots College, welcome. It's good to see some people with the, the future generations in the room too. Um, have asked a bit about incentives to attain, but before we get to that, can you just give a snapshot of what you're trying to do around medical schools, or maybe a contrast between the New Zealand system of training medical professionals and some of the innovations that have been happening in other places? Yeah, absolutely. So New Zealand currently has two medical schools, one at the University of Auckland, one at the University of Otago, um, and they deliver one model of medical education. It's a standard, uh, traditional six-year undergraduate program. Uh, students are selected in after a competitive first-year health science program into the second year. That's where our real restriction is put in place. And then once students make it to that point, they effectively all graduate, complete, go out into workforce. Um, as there's alluded to though, the selection process that goes into that model and also the training model where the vast majority of the clinical training happens in tertiary hospitals means that students are far more likely to choose a specialty that's delivered in a tertiary hospital from familiarity apart from anything else uh, compared to general practice. So uh, on average about one in six graduates that are going to come out of our existing medical schools, that style of medical education will choose uh, general practice. If we contrast that uh, to other models that we can see globally, uh, the dominant model of medical education in Australia is now what's known as graduate entry medicine. So students complete an existing bachelor's degree in a wide range of different subjects. They are selected into the program at a different stage of life, a point at which uh, they probably really know who they are as an individual and what they want to do, distinct from what mum and dad might have wanted them to do when they were 17 and at high school. Uh, and so you've got a bit more information to be able to be a bit more targeted around well, what, what sort of future pathway does this person want to have and, and try to prioritise students that are more likely to choose a general practice or primary care specialty. So if we compare to one of those four-year graduate entry uh, programs uh, across Australia, we see uh, rates of about 40, 50, even 60% of graduates choosing to go into primary care at the other end of it. So when we think about targeted investment into our biggest challenges and our biggest problems, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to increase the size of programs where one in six are going into your biggest need mm -hmm. compared to standing up a new program where you can hope to get 40, 50 or 60% of students graduating and going out into that uh, particular area of need. The other thing that's uh, unique about uh, the program that we've, we've proposed here at Waikato is a really strong focus in our regional and rural communities. So students do what is known as longitudinal placements. They spend a whole year in a local community, really getting to know that community, uh, really being uh, closely embedded in it. And there's some really successful models of how that works and operates in Australia that we'd like to uh, translate into the New Zealand context, uh, make it fit for purpose for us here, uh, and really deliver the health workforce needs that uh, we have. Thanks, Joe. I, I'm, I'll step off workforce, although it's all connected, and pass across to you, Cecilia. There's another question here. How do public and private sector collaborations work to deliver some of the needs we meet, whether that be in workforce or in technology or in funding models? How do you think about public-private sector collaboration? Yeah, look, I mean, I think I feel positive about it now. Um, I think that there is a positive shift towards welcoming business to come up with solutions and actually help support and identify the issues that um, we're seeing in primary health care. Uh, and look, we are a private endeavour that's, um, you know, partially pu publicly funded uh, through capitation funding. Uh, but I think that that's what we need more models of. We need the public sector to come closer towards the private sector and actually have those conversations and look at the innovations that are happening. And that's across a range of industries, right? Ours is just one example. Um, but, you know, for us, and going back to something um, that Des said about the unenrolled population, we need to be thinking differently to be resolving the problems that we're seeing. 
you know, we're seeing the unenrolled population, this half a million people who are presenting to EDs and are taking up spots for all of us when we actually need to go because something bad has happened. You know, we see fairly straightforward solutions to those issues, such as being able to enrol patients in remote communities where they can't help access healthcare and actually provide con continuity of care for the, to them through other healthcare professionals like nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, physios, um, prescribing pharmacists, pharmacists, there's a range of people in your communities that can actually provide you with services. And currently we're not able to connect the dots on all of the healthcare workers and GPs kind of remain uh, the centre of it. And so that's a model we need to move away from. But if we're going to move away from that model, we're going to need that real partnership in place between the private sector and the public sector to make those things and those innovations happen, right? Mm. Thank you. Deb? Look, I think we need to address one of the great misconceptions which exist. I mentioned one before, that we have a health system when we don't. Mm. The other is that our health system is publicly provided. Well, it actually isn't. In 1938, uh, Michael Joseph Savage tried to introduce a universal public health care system, but the New Zealand chapter of the British Medical Association, the GPs opposed him and rolled him. You imagine that, the political economy of that group, the political capital that Savage must have had after the Great Depression, but he was rolled in terms of uh, primary care. Most of our health care is delivered by private providers. Mm. The GPs are private, mm. the retail pharmacists are private, mm. the dentists are private, the physiotherapists, the they're all privately employed. We have a largely publicly funded but privately delivered health care system. And I keep having people having saying to me, oh, dears, the sorts of things you're recommending are privatisation by stealth. That's a nonsense. It already is privatised. And we've got to move to a values system for our health system. We should purchase health care from the provider who can give us the best outcome mm. at the lowest cost. Totally. That's the definition from Michael Porter, who's the value guru from Harvard. Now, if the person that can provide us with the best outcomes at the lowest cost happens to be publicly employed, so be it, or privately employed but not for profit, so be it, or privately employed for profit, so be it, we should be agnostic about the type of employment the provider has and focus on the value proposition. And this is moving to the idea of tight, loose, tight, health purchasing or commissioning, where you're very tight about the outcomes you want. For example, the outcome from a hip operation is mobility, being able to get the recreations back, getting back to work. The outcomes you want from cataract surgery is being able to get some get their license back and regain their independence. You have to be tight about the outcome you want. Mm. You have to be tight about how you measure it and what the consequences of it not being achieved, but absolutely agnostic about how it's done and who does it. Tight, loose, tight. And that is basing a health system on value. And if people want to jump up and down and say, hey, that private provider is making a profit, I'm going to say to them, they're providing us with a better outcome at a lower cost. Which of those two bits don't you like? But I think it's an absolute misconception that we have a publicly delivered health system. We do not. Thank you, Des. Uh, don't put the microphone down too fast. We. Um you touched on it there, and there's questions come through as well. I want to dive into funding, and of course others might have views here. Can you give a picture, this is, this is not a health conference, it's a general audience, can you give a picture of the current fond funding model and touch on how we might change that with a particular, if you can run us through that concept of social insurance? The, the, the current funding model, as I said, is based on purchasing from provider groups a certain level of activity per year. So they're paid to do outputs, not to achieve anything, to, to do outputs. So that's the hospital system, it's based on activity. The primary care system's based on a capitation largely with some fee for service, but tragically, the capitation, the calculus used in the capitation for GPs was based on the 15 minute consultation, which makes GP specialist services almost impossible. But our system is pay as you go. And what pay as you go systems do is they accumulate a deficit for future generations. The social insurance schemes, on the other hand, have in their basis accumulating enough money so that they can pay for their future liabilities. And as I said, the great attraction of social insurance 
is that it encourages investment in conditions where the benefit to the individual and society is realized across time. If you take the Swiss system, for example, the Swiss government has defined a set of core services. Every citizen in Switzerland is entitled to this core of services. And then the insurance companies are required to provide an insurance which meets those core services. And there's a fixed price for that. So how do you and I choose which insurance company to go to? They compete for our business on the basis of additional extras, like a cancer extra or a trauma extra. And so they compete very hard to actually provide us with additional services. But it's in their interests to reduce the costs of delivering those core services. And this is moving to a fully funded model. And if you think it's impossible to move from pay-as-you-go debt based systems to being fully forward funded. We've already done that in New Zealand with ACC. Mm. ACC has gone from being a organization which had incurred a debt of all, close to $30 billion on behalf of all New Zealanders to now something which has enough money in the bank to meet its future liabilities. When I was on the board at ACC, there were two things we paid attention to. One was our, uh, our consumer uh, uh, ratings and the other was our outstanding claims liability. And we would be given a figure like, at the moment, our outstanding claims liability is 101% of the money we've got in the bank, mm. or whatever. So social insurance schemes are a step towards being fully forward funded, whereas our current tax-based healthcare funding only works if you have a relatively large population of young people paying a lot of tax and not consuming a lot of health care and that's no longer our demographic and the health system that model itself on us people say oh, we modeled ourselves on the national health service that's not true they model themselves on us both the national health service and our health service have got to the point where it's almost impossible for public providers to live within their means thank you i'm going to switch tax now uh, a lot of interest in a question here about mental health. So I was uh, driving the kids to school this week and heard media about police talking of stepping back from being frontline providers in the case of mental health, which I could understand. Uh, a discussion of whether to add mental health as an option on when you dial 111. A number that struck me, the police have dealt with 77,000 call-outs that relate to mental health, which they are saying they're grappling with some of the, the law and order things that they do. Um, you talk about a 15 minute visit. Those models just are not gonna work together. How do you potentially see this? How do you see us resourcing, funding, managing to deal with mental health, particularly when you factor in the notion of a lack of uh, homegrown workforce, because mental health is often culturally context specific and it can be very hard to arrive into a different country and meet that. I'll start there, but I'm interested no, I'll in I'll be very quick. Um, mental health is almost a poster child for social investment. Uh, health inequities are largely socially determined, housing, education, employment. But if you think about a health system, it doesn't actually control education, housing, or employment. So the first thing you realize is that most of the factors which determine the well-being of our society are outside the gift of the health system. And most of the impact of mental health, with all due respect, is also outside the health system. Mental, poor mental health is cheap to the health system, but it's expensive to the education system, child protection systems, the social welfare systems, the police service, and the prison service. So you need a whole of society approach to seriously address the predominant drivers of poor mental health and social investment is the vehicle to drive that. In terms of the single biggest step we can take in providing better mental health, Matt, the first person people go to see with a mental health problem is their GP. The majority of people with a mental health problem first make contact with their family doctor. The simple solution is to say to the GPs, if you're prepared to be upskilled and if you're prepared to be part of a network which includes a couple of psychiatrists, will allow you to have extended consultation times for people with mental health problems and will pay you accordingly. So you take the community that are already going, that are already seeing 
people first up, and instead of a 15 minute, which is impossible, by the time I say hello, how are you, sit down, then please leave, you're irritating me, we have seven or eight minutes of meaningful contact time. Well, I, I just have to say, I spent an hour with a new patient, and I struggle to do it in an hour. The idea you do it in 15 minutes is ri ridiculous. So uh, I think if you're going to tell you one thing in the mental health agenda, it's to power up the general practice community by paying them to do meaningful first contacts with people with mental health. But I say it again, mental health should be the poster child for the social investment approach. Thank you, and I um, will touch on that in our social, panel, uh, social investment panel this afternoon, I'm sure. Cecilia? Yeah, look, I mean, I've got a, a slightly different view from Des. I mean, we align on a lot of the things that he's saying, but we're operationalising a large portion of what Des is talking about. And, you know, I've got GPs that are saying a significant burden of mental health patients. We've got about 500 clinicians at 10, or 500 staff at 10, 300 clinicians. And, you know, about a quarter to a third of all appointments are mental health related. Um, and actually, a significant amount of my GPs have not qualified as psychologists and they don't want to necessarily do that work. Um, if they wanted to be a psychologist, that's what they would have qualified as and that's what the community tells us. And so how are we resolving that problem? Uh, we're resolving it early for intervention. And so what we're doing is, first of all, we need to understand that there's different types of mental health presentations everything from a student who's really concerned about and has anxiety around an exam that they have to obviously some of the most severe um, cases that you can see. So there's a really broad spectra, spectrum of presentation. And then what we're doing is that we're looking at the individual cases and endeavouring to assign them to the right person to see them in the right way at the right time. And by that I mean a health improvement practitioner, a health coach, it might be someone that's a nurse, a mental health nurse, it might be a GP who wants to be paid more and is interested in mental health, right? But unfortunately it's not a one size fits all approach and so we need to be better aligning it to who the person is, what they're presenting with and whoever is best to deliver that service. But what I'm really clear on is that we cannot fragment mental health away from primary practice. It actually has to be delivered together. And that what we're saying at a global level is that these kind of pop-up mental health services that are fragmented from your wider primary health care are occurring. And we believe that actually your mental health, alongside any other health issues that you have presenting, needs to be resolved by primary care. Um, and we can do that by delivering it by different people in different ways at a different cost, both to the system and to that person. Um, and again, we're having really good success seeing this right. And we're also intervening at an early stage. If we're seeing a patient that's presenting with complex mental health issues, you know, our team is pre-intervening with that patient saying, look, before you present to a GP, you need a half an hour appointment. And if you're not prepared to pay that, then it might be better that you see the mental health nurse or a health improvement practitioner. Unfortunately, the budget held for some of the key roles for primary health care is actually held by PHOs and, and clipping the ticket along the way on the services that we're delivering. And so we could utilise more people across the space who are not GPs, uh, but unfortunately it's very difficult for us right now. Thank you. Joe, your take? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, you know, there's a phrase that there's no health without mental health. And at times we seem to try to create mental health as its own thing to deal with. And we miss the fact that it's actually an integrated part of who somebody is. Uh, and so thinking about workforce and thinking about, you know, well, what is what are modern curricula, what are modern programs look like, uh, how are we equipping our GPs, our nurses, our physios, our midwives, um, this is not a, a one-size-fits-all kind of um, approach. So, you know, a lot of what we've been developing here at the University of Waikato, it's a, it's a really integrated approach to mental and physical health, not trying to treat them as two totally disparate or, or separate um, activities which I think you know, it's, the, it's the key to uh, trying to address it. There's also the issue around scope, which I think Cecilia touched on a little bit in the sense that we've got psychologists. Oh, you just lost there. I've got no batteries. Oh, no, we're back again. Um, we've got GPs, we have psychiatrists, we've, we have different people who have different roles, um, but those scopes are quite well defined. We're on the, we're on the blink. 
Um, those scopes are quite well defined, and the question is thinking going forward, um, are those boundaries appropriate? You know, those scopes of practice were set some time ago. Should we be looking at some form of clinical psychologist who does have prescribing rights in a limited sense, a little bit like a designated uh, nurse prescriber or a nurse practitioner can prescribe some medications but not others? So starting to think about triaging and some of the more common, uh, more clearly defined mental health uh, uh, challenges that people might be facing, uh, thinking about what's the most appropriate scope of practice to be able to deal and manage with that situation. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, we saw a significant amount of funds supposedly go into mental health, but as a primary health care provider, we saw none of it, right? And there was a significant amount, and this is going back to Des's point around outcome-based funding, you know, intervention doesn't mean outcome, and I think we need to understand that as a population, you know, there's um, a report around how some of that funding was spent, and it basically cost us as taxpayers 300 bucks to see one patient um, as an intervention, but we don't know what the outcome is of those patients, so we need to be a lot more targeted around how funding is allocated and who it's allocated to. Mm. Can I ask, we're, we're going to have a discussion in this room after lunch about demographics. Um, it's been touched on already. Can I ask, and I'll maybe go to you on this one, Des, what changes, for better or worse, in demographics in the next 10, 20 years and I'm interested in that, the ageing population, definitely, but also the diversity of our population. Mm -hmm. And how, when we're thinking about equity of access, how do we make sure we're reaching people? Uh, again, an, a very good question. You're right. Most attention has been paid to uh, our relative ageing and the impact that has, because most people consume the majority of their health care just before they die. It used to be in the last year of your life, but mm. my profession has become so good at keeping you alive, <laughs> it's now the last 10 years of your life. The penalties of success. Uh, well, it's a perverse success, but you're not, dying of some, you're not dying young of some infectious disease, you're not dying young of heart disease, you're not dying younger from some form of simple cancer. You're now living old enough so that the rate of dementia, for example, is increasing by 4% cumulative per annum. So the problem that we have got, we've created, and we've created by maintaining people well past, if you like, their biological use-by dates. <laughs> um, I see some nervous faces in the room. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so the most attention is on uh, that demographic shift. In terms of the diversity of our community, which of course is something we need to celebrate, the minute you try to aggregate health risks to the level of race, I think you introduce a whole series of anomalies and uh, biases which actually don't lead to good outcomes. For example, and I think this is a point that Bill English made that I really like, we don't need to aggregate risk to a community or to a racial group. We know the problem is the people who live at 9 Moa Street in Otaho. That's the problem. We know it's that individual over there. We actually can define who our at-risk people are and our at-risk families are, there's no need to aggregate risk. We can actually identify the vulnerable individuals. We need to wrap services around them, almost agnostic of culture or race, although having said that, clearly the services need to be culturally mm. appropriate. appropriate. And, of course, the way to ensure that is for the, con the person that you're wrapping services around to define what the outcomes are that they want. And that's why individual budget holdings are such a powerful tool, because if the person holds the budget and employs their providers, then they are absolutely in the driver's seat in terms of determining what the outcomes are. And certainly for mental health problems, I think individual budget holdings for chronic mental health uh, is a solution to a problem which is overdue. But the ageing demographic matter is the one that's got us fixated. We may well have a demographic problem of a large number of unemployed younger people. Uh, we are not sure yet what the technological impact will be on employment, uh, and particularly employment for people who don't have transferable skills. Uh, but again, I think the focus in the future has to be on our ability to identify individuals and families in distress and to focus on those. Thank you.
Um, we'll pass it to you, Cecilia, maybe uh, yeah, comment on that, and we'll keep, the, we'll keep it relatively brief, because I have got one final question for you all before we go to lunch. Yeah, so uh, briefly, um, I mean, I think it's by 2040, one in three children are going to be born Māori, so, you know, it's all of us New Zealanders, and again, what we're demonstrating at TEND is that if you have a accessible healthcare system, where a person presenting can pick the type of clinician that they need to see, whether that's based on an urgent need to see someone or it's culturally, you want to see someone that's aligned with you from a language perspective, you want to speak to someone that speaks your language, whether it's a gender, whether it's a specialty, that's how you overcome some of those access and equity issues. And so we, we're feeling really confident that you can overcome that and you don't have a separate system that needs to ensure that you can cater to everybody within the same system as long as you're making it easy for people to access those services. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. All right, we've got uh, six or seven minutes to go and we, we can see the screen here. Uh, it's time for you to uh, do some imagining. So the three of you, you're running the ship, we heard from the Minister of Finance uh, this morning, but let's say that you had the power, you were, you were governing and you had control of the system over the next two, three, five years, the next, say, couple of electoral cycles. Um, what are your priorities and what do you want to see happen? I'll start with you, Cecilia, you've got the mic. Well, look, I would incentivise the opportunity for private and public, although as Des says, it is already private, businesses to work alongside government to help provide solutions to the problems that we're facing. Um, I would ensure that we're picking up on the unenrolled population across New Zealand and actually appropriately accessing the services from a public health perspective that they need. Um, and so I think we really need to think long and hard about what a health system looks like rather than an activity-based system like Des is talking about and how we drive those outcomes from an early stage. And so for us, it is an investment in technology. It is an investment in a broad um, group of skill sets uh, and acknowledging that you know, we have to have multiple people providing services um, to be able to make healthcare um, both an attractive and um, a positive place to be, and to be someone who's providing services. Um, so look, that's a challenge to government here, is ensuring that you're working really closely with the parties in the industry, uh, and that you're coming up with solutions alongside them, not independently from them, which is something that we've seen in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Joe. <laughs> yeah, where would you want that? Well, well, yeah. I, I think we have no self interest at all in that uh, statement, um, but priority two would be really around some sort of universal student allowance uh, for students studying priority subjects like midwifery and nursing and others. Uh, let's get students through these programs and successfully, let's get them through and out into the workforce. Thank you, Joe. And Des. Uh, just to comment on, um, I know Joe didn't like the term earn as you learn, I like it. I like um, it too. <laughs> earn as you learn, I think, has great attraction, particularly in areas like nursing and mid midwifery. Yeah. Uh, our loss of students in nursing and midwifery is completely unacceptable, yes. particularly for young uh, Maori and Pacifica people studying nursing and midwifery. To lose a third of our students in, a, in a, these programs is completely unacceptable. And so those programs do need to attend to academic bridging uh, to account for perhaps uh, less than ideal secondary school education. They do need to take care of things like childcare and transport. But I think when they start as students to contributing to the service load, then they should be getting paid. And so I think earn as you learn is a good idea. Now the reason why Joe's uh, anxious about the term is it invokes all sorts of feral responses from some of the senior nursing <laughs> hierarchy who think the shift away from hospital training to university training was the best thing that ever happened, whereas I don't agree with that perspective. To answer your other question, Matt, about um, priorities, I think at a uh, strategic level, health needs to shift to be seen as a service industry, mm. and like any other service industry, needs to understand that it lives and dies to serve the community, and that the community's needs, individual needs, should drive the process, not, as we've seen with that, literally half-baked reform of the last government of actually uh, shifting all the bureaucrats to Wellington and the expectation that centralised command and control might solve the problem. That's the antithesis of how social our service industries work. You need to shift the decision-making as close as possible to where 
the services are delivered. I think our health system also needs to move without any uh, excuse to a values-based system where we purchase on the basis of the value proposition and not on the basis of this nature of employment or the type of process. But uh, priorities, I think, in terms of a tactical answer, uh, we first need to keep this walker afloat, and that is keeping the workforce we've got in place and to extend them. So it's an it's a exercise in retention and extension of the existing workforce. In terms of the second priority, uh, my second priority is that the attention we should be focused on is the business models in primary care. If we are to liberate our health system and to generate the teaching capacity and the service capacity we need, if we are to shift care out of the hospitals into the community, we need completely different business models operating in primary care. So uh, keep the walker afloat and how do we get to Aotearoa? I think uh, the answer is uh, by addressing the, pr the business model need in primary care as a singular determined focus. Thank you, Des. Look, that's it for this session before we break for lunch. Uh, an incredibly rich discussion. I was pleased to get not only insights into the challenges, but very practical, pragmatic suggestions. Um, I ask the group to put your hands together for our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Hello. All right, before we go to the music, uh, the mood enhancing music, we are about to break for lunch, so a couple of notices on logistics here. The food will be served at the back corner of the par. You can go down the ramp there and cycle through. Um, as I say, the retail option is uh, open if you would prefer a curry. Um, a couple of notes about how the rest of today will work out. We will be inviting you all for a drink at five o'clock at the conclusion of today's session. I mentioned earlier that one of my colleagues, Fetu, will be leading a tour of the PAR facility at about quarter past five for anybody that wants to take part in that. Meet out on the maho just out in front by the lawn, in front of the whare nui behind me. Uh, an important note for dinner, we are booked to capacity for our dinner tonight where we'll hear from Helen Clark and Jim Bolger. Um, if you have not bought a ticket for dinner, uh, please don't come to the dinner. For all of the rest of you, you are very, very welcome. If you cannot uh, remember, please see somebody at the registration desk, uh, conscious that uh, some people did choose to do that and some people didn't and um, we are at capacity for dinner, so please see someone there. Important note for just after lunch, we will be coming back and we want people seated just before one o'clock, so we call it 12.55. This will be a split session uh, just after lunch for one session. In the room, te kopuroa, to my left, the long room, we will be having the session on tax and doing tax differently. Obviously a hot topic coming into the election cycle and no doubt will be for many. In this room, we'll be having the session on demographics, so you can leave things where they are, that will be fine, but the tax session will be in that room, the demographic session will be here. Please choose which one you want to go to, and please be back seated at about 12.55, 1 o'clock. Enjoy your lunch, and I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Kia ora. <laughs>